Welcome to Good Dog Pro, the weekly video podcast that's all about having a good dog without using fear or pain. Hosted by Drayton Michaels, CTC, Pitbull Guru, and founder of Urban Dogs and ModernDogTraining.com, and Kim Merritt, co-founder of GoodDogInABox.com and GoodDogPro.com, and founder of The URL Doctor. This episode is brought to you by GoodDogInABox.com, reward-based dog training and dog bite prevention products for families with kids and dogs. GoodDogPro.com, the online content subscription and community for dog professionals with reward-based dog training products, curriculums, and online courses to educate, motivate, and positively impact those that work with dogs. And ModernDogTraining.com, remote consulting for you and your dog with Drayton Michaels. Now, let's join Good Dog Pro. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Hey, Drayton, how are you today? I'm well, Kim. How are you? I'm doing great. So we got a great subject today, puppies. Everybody loves puppies. We all can't wait to get them, and they're cute, and they're furry, and then about a week into things, we think, oh, my God, what did I do? Work. (laughs) My life has completely changed. (laughs) So we want to give some great ideas and and help to people who either have a new puppy or who are thinking about getting a puppy how to make this puppy not be a disaster and not totally wreck your life but be a a great asset to it so drayton what's what's the first thing you say to somebody about getting a puppy well if they haven't gotten a puppy yet the first thing i remind them of is there's going to be a lot of work and it doesn't really level off for about a year or so and then depending on the dog and depending on your lifestyle etc there's a lot of variables but you know dogs in general are work but puppies obviously are going to be a little bit more and it's loss of sleep you got house training issues Uh, you know if you have children in the mix then you have to remember that you have to divide your time there's going to be management with gates crate training so Again, I don't discourage people from getting puppies, but I definitely remind them that, you know, it's going to be work, so be prepared for it. And then it's really about, you know, socialization and and a really good puppy class um, and just being proactive, making sure your dog is properly socialized and you're, you're helping them get through stuff and learning that they're safe. So here's, here's a question and I hear it from people all the time. We just did a, a puppy course at uh, Good Dog in a Box and all the people that we had come in with their puppies. The first question they asked was, well, my vet told me not to take my puppy out until it's fully vaccinated. When can right. you bring up a really good when point? Can I have um, it and people? I send every single inquiry that comes to my to, to my attention about puppies, I send a PDF among many things, but one of the PDFs I send is from Avsab. And what they say is, as long as your puppy has one round of vaccinations and you are socializing with other vaccinated puppies in a clean environment, get your puppy to a place to socialize that. Now, with that said, I wouldn't put a puppy on the floor of a vet waiting room. Right. Right? So I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't walk a puppy outside of a veterinary office if they had to go to the bathroom. Right. I wouldn't bring a puppy to a public park where there's a lot of bird droppings and other things going on. Right. Until they're fully vaccinated. But I would bring them to my backyard. I would bring them to my front yard. I would possibly, you know, depending on where I lived and what was going on, walk them around my, you know, neighborhood, etc. But this idea that you have to wait until a puppy is fully vaccinated to socialize them is hindering their behavioral development. First of all, at eight weeks, when puppies usually come into someone's life, because that's when breeders let them out, eight to 10 weeks, they're, they're vaccinated already, okay? So they're already set to go out into the world and deal with stuff. Secondly, behavioral development, you have that fear period that sets in around eight, nine, 10 weeks and lasts to about 10, 11 weeks, somewhere in there. And then another one at 16 weeks. So if your puppy is basically in the house in the yard, house in the yard for what, two, three, four weeks, right? five weeks like like when is the dog fully vaccinated usually somewhere at the tail end right you're missing all this time and your puppy's not playing with other puppies they're they're experiencing nothing really other than your yard and your house and that's damaging to a lot of puppies especially if those puppies already have some sort of inordinate fear issues based on you know their their breed like german shepherds chows 
Dobermans, um, who like there, there's you know a number of breeds of dogs who have been selected for a long time to have a little bit more fear because they're bred to be guard dogs. Now it's not a hard and fast rule, but for sure, if you have a dog that you know that their history has been bred to have some suspicion, right. you need to get them out and socialize sooner rather than later. And not just socializing with other dogs, but with people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right because, you know, people aren't just you and your family or the random people you see when you're out on a walk or in your yard. I mean, people encompass everything from little tiny babies all the way up to older people who might have a cane or a walker or something that's weird to a puppy. So, again, you bring up a great point. You want to expose your puppy to all kinds and types of people and situations. And when you do it, you want to counter condition. Now, for those watching this, you can go back. We did a very in-depth show on counter conditioning, so you can watch that one. But essentially, it's the process of pairing an event or a stimulus with a high-value food reward. So the puppy goes, oh, wow, look at that, a baby carriage. And you go, yes, and you treat them. And if the dog watches that baby carriage for 10 seconds, every two seconds, you should yes and treat that dog. Or move away, pick the puppy up and create distance if it's not going to be amenable, if the puppy's going to be, you know, shattered by the event or maybe, you know, barking and stuff. You have to have you, you know, use some good judgment. But it's not just about socializing. It's about socializing and counter conditioning and pairing those events and making it safe for the puppy. Because again, just to go back and do a little quick reminder, safe, unsafe, neutral, that's how all dogs see everything. And you want to really teach your puppy that, you know, when you don't feel safe, guess what? You actually are. So what do you recommend as far as controlling a, a meet situation between two puppies versus a, you're out and, and you want your puppy to meet people? What's the best way for somebody with a new puppy to control that so it's a positive experience? Well, I tell every single person who comes to me for puppy kindergarten, I tell them in orientation, don't meet unknown dogs. And an unknown dog is a dog you don't know. It's not Janie and Joe who live next door and you've been to their barbecue and you know the dog. You see him walk for the last five years. It's a social dog, right? You can meet that dog with your puppy. However, if you there's some random dog, you don't really know him, I wouldn't meet that dog for a number of reasons. When puppies meet dogs, a lot of times <sighs> they're all excited and that dog may not want to deal with that and they may snap at that dog. A sound, well-socialized dog may not want to deal with that puppy because the first instance of that dog meeting is nose-to-nose -nose and eye contact. So teeth and eye contact are threat signals and weapons in nature, right? So you can have a very well-socialized dog who has dog friends, but maybe he doesn't want to deal with that little puppy all up in his business. And if the dog meets 10 dogs and eight of them snap or growl at him, then that dog's learning that 80% of the time I meet dogs, it doesn't really work out. Right. Because in order for it to work out, dogs need to do a little circle, right? A little smell, butt smell. And that's never going to get orchestrated with a random person or even your friends. But again, if you know the people in the dog, go for it. But this is where going to puppy socials and going to puppy kindergarten class is really crucial. And one of the things that I often tell clients when they call about puppies, they'll say, well, geez, you know, we have a dog at home and we got three neighbor friends and my sister's dog. That's great. Nobody is saying don't have your puppy socialize with adolescent or adult dogs. But adolescent and adult dogs have defined play skills. They have a defined play sequence usually with their friends. Puppies don't. And it's okay for the puppy to learn from those dogs, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But they really need to play with puppies in their own age group, right? They need to play with puppies who are between eight weeks and 18, 20 weeks is where their puppyhood ends. So you really want to get your puppy into a puppy social where there are, you know, force-free, positive reward-based approaches. Nobody's yelling. Nobody's using air horns and shouting at puppies. And it's being refereed and shaped by the trainers in a way where the puppies learn above all else, you're safe, right? And then, you know, for anybody watching this, you can go to the Urban Dogs YouTube channel. I have a, a bunch of videos on puppy play and how to referee it and why to shape it and why to reduce that stress for puppies. So if you're doing this with your puppy, you're getting them out, right? They're meeting people that you know, and they're meeting new people you may not know, and they're meeting dogs who are friendly and socialized that you know, and you're making sure those exchanges go well and the puppy feels safe. Get your puppy into a puppy class or a puppy social for the whole time they're in puppy, you know, uh, hood, the whole time, right? So as soon as you can get them in, they're going to do much better as an adolescent dog. They're going to do much better as an adult dog. And what I always tell puppy parents is puppyhood is often easier than adolescence. So if you set up your puppyhood so the puppy feels good about stuff and has really good training skills, your adolescence is going to be much easier. Absolutely. So as soon as you get a puppy, 
sign up for puppy class and get it into puppy class? Yeah. And the other thing is scheduling. So in my case, if somebody contacts me, let's say on June 1st and their puppy's eight weeks, but I don't have a puppy class starting for another three weeks. So now your puppy is going to be 11 weeks when you start class. My class is the first class is a human only orientation. No puppies. We just get the, all the doggy parents in the room so we can actually focus and talk about what we need to for class and the stuff going on outside of class, which we'll talk about in a sec. And if you have that kind of diligent scheduling going, you're not going to miss your window. You're going to get into a class, a good trainer and a, a, a good puppy program. They sell out quick. I have a maximum of six puppies, a minimum of four. So I always tell people, you know, I could have one person signed up on Friday and by Monday, the whole class is filled. And it's feast or famine, you know, so you want to want to make sure when you're out there, like you're, if, if you know it's a good puppy program, you've had three friends go, it's got good reviews, positive training, just sign up for it. Don't don't him and haw because the, the clock is ticking and you don't have four or five, six puppies for your puppy to play with. Most people don't. You might have a handful of dogs in your friends and your family circle. But again, they're not puppies and you want your puppy to learn to play with puppies, just like you want little kids to go and learn how to play with people their own age they can still play with their older cousins and the neighbor kids and so forth and adults can play with them but it's really beneficial for their development to go play with kids in their age group it just it makes sense absolutely absolutely so what should that puppy class look like what, what well, do you expect yeah i mean again it's a, a good question because not all training programs are created equal so first thing you want to ask is how do you train dogs? Do you use fear and pain? Do you use choke chains and shock collars? Do you push dogs down? Do you blame? Do you blame us? Find out. Just ask those questions. Don't, don't even mince words. Just say, do you do these things? And if they do, run. Don't sign up. Go to a puppy program that is going to be positive reinforcement based with people who are going to have empathy and they're going to have patience and they're really going to help you develop your puppy to be sound. What I always tell my, my puppy students don't let your training in this class be a reflection on how your dog is going to be trained because you don't have four or five other puppies in your life. That's a huge distraction. So just have fun. The most important thing to have in a puppy class is fun. And then to learn, to have an instructor or a set of instructors who are really going to teach you how to train your dog and going to explain behavior so that going forward, you're prepared for things. You're not freaked out if the puppy growls. You're like, oh, it's okay. Good boy. Oh, let me go get some steak from the fridge and drop a couple pieces because this is the first time you've had a bully stick. And it's really valuable. And Drayton explained to me resource guarding is natural. That's how dogs would survive. And my puppy is how old? 12 weeks. Not a lot of time on the planet. My joke is we have food in our refrigerators older than our puppies, right? Because we're Americans. We don't throw anything out. We smell it first and make the kid eat it. Is it okay? Yeah, all right. We're, and we're, that's for dinner, right? So you, you have a clock that's ticking with your puppy, right? And, and you, need to have, you need to have good professional guidance because if you make some seemingly basic choices that involve hey, stop, to your puppy because they're mouthy. Yeah, they might stop mouthing you, but they might be afraid of hands. This is called the critical development period for a reason. It's a critical part of this dog's life. They are learning about things for the first time. So again, the dirty little secret in dog training is all about the human. So um, I'm curious what your uh, thought is on how young is too young to get your puppy from wherever it's coming from. Well, most readers, if they are ethical, and then, then that is a whole other discussion. But, you know, if if it's a good breeder, they're, they're letting the dog go between eight to 10 weeks. So they might want to get it out of, the, uh, out of there by eight weeks. But let's say the people are like, well, you know, we're on vacation or whatever. We can't come get the puppy. You know, they'll hold the puppy if, if they go and meet the people. The, right, everything works out. And this is the people that are going to get this puppy. You know, but typically breeders don't want to hold on to puppies past eight to 10 weeks. They want them out the door. And are there questions that we as a, a potential pet parent should be asking the breeder as far as what kind of socialization and things they uh, Yes and no. And here, and, and again, I'm not throwing breeders under the bus, but breeders have dogs um, make babies. That's what they do. And I don't take behavior advice from breeders. I don't take dietary advice from breeders. I hope that the dog is really healthy and cognitively sound. If the breeder can do that, then you've done your job. I, it's, it's like I don't ask veterinarians for behavior advice because they don't get behavior. And be, I'm telling you, the, the thing that, that people have to realize is that it's all about behavior. Because no matter what happens, you have the puppy now. And if they're 12 weeks of age and there's something going on with their health, right, or their cognition, 
Well, that's the from the breeder, right? So you can talk to them about, you know, why is my puppy slow to develop? Why is my puppy quiet when, right? and they might or might not have the answer, right? And that's the other thing. What you want to make sure from a breeder is that you're getting a, a dog from somebody who is breeding dogs who are healthy and sound, and they're not just pumping dogs out. They're not just like, you, you have to do your homework. Me personally, I always encourage people to adopt a puppy because there's plenty of dogs out there who are puppies and they're in a shelter right now or a rescue and foster in somebody's home and there's six or seven puppies and a mama dog and there's every kind of breed that needs rescue, right? So it's not just, well, you know, I want this kind of breed and they don't, have, no, they're there. You might have to do a little bit more work, but you can do it. You know, I don't judge people who get dogs from breeders, but me personally, I would do everything uh, it, it, to, re, to, to recommend people try to rescue that puppy. And ultimately every puppy that's in a well- uh, cared for situation with good people, you know, making an honest effort is a rescued dog. Let's face it. If the dog's with good people, the dog got rescued. Right? So we, we've got this puppy and we've, we've, we've signed up for a, a puppy kindergarten. We're, we're taking it to that. We're taking the puppy out and, and meeting people. Um, what else do we want to be doing? What Well, then you have to, yeah, I mean, that's 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 all in the socialization category, and it's huge. It's crucial. But then we have the other side of puppies, which is mildly bitey, jumpy, barky, right? Separation, stress, all that. So let's just address that. All puppies are mouthy, right? The thing that I remind people of is don't freak out because hands are the number one appendage. So you really want a good association of hands. Everything you're going to do with your puppy from petting them to putting on their gear all that's going to be hand association. So you really want to have you really want to have a good association in your hands. You have to understand something. Puppies are experiencing everything pretty much for the first time or experiencing each day for, you know, it's novel. So you want to be patient. Um, human sweat contains butyric acid. Dogs are drawn to butyric acid. That's why they're always licking us. So anything in your house, including your hands and your feet and your hair and your face, have sweat on it and your dog is going to be attracted to it. So that's a, a really big reason why dogs are really attracted to your shoes and the remote control and the kids' toys because it smells like sweat, right? And dogs like that. So chewing, legal items with management. So you set up your home so it's puppy-proof, right? Most puppies for, you know, a, a couple months, you can get away with them in a big pen or a, a room that's really locked down so they can't get to wires and stuff. So if the puppy is in an area that's appropriately sized and they're chewing on stuff, and you're strategically feeding with work to eat toys. So, you know, hopefully people understand that you can use food puzzle toys from Kongs and Planet Dog to parse out a meal over the course of, let's say, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes. So your dog, your puppy is eating breakfast from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., not 6 a.m. to 6.05, <laughs> right? So that's going to help with the mouthing because your dog is daily, your puppy is going to be chewing and dissecting, chewing and dissecting, right? That's going to help. Things like bully sticks, you know, anything that's going to keep, that's going to be huge. Secondly, for the mouthing, fetch and tug, fetch and tug, but not just fetch and tug with fetch and tug with rules. So the clients that come to me for puppy kindergarten, I give them PDFs on how to play fetch and tug. Most puppies, if you throw something, they'll go check it out. And if they pick it up and they start running back from you, back to you with it, what you should do is you should say, drop it, and then throw a bunch of treats on the ground, like two or three treats. So they go, oh, okay, and they drop it. Pretty soon, if you keep doing that, what the puppy's going to realize is when you say, drop it, the food's coming. So they're going to drop the toy before the food comes. And then at some point you can replace the food with the toy toss and then you can drop it, pick up the toy, boom, go get it. So that's a really way, a really good way to keep the dog's mouth busy and keep their brain engaged and help them train, right? Because once they start dropping it, you can get a sit, toss the toy. Tug. The thing about tug is most dogs, if they like to tug already, it's not tug you need to work on, it's drop it. So really easy. The puppy gets the tugged rope and you should use something like three to five feet so you got space for your hands when they get a good purchase and they're tugging it you count 1001 1002 and you say drop it and you put food in their nose now you notice i release the pressure of the rope and i put food in their nose you don't want to keep tugging because you want to disengage the opposition reflex that all dogs have so you say drop it release pressure food on the nose yes mark them give them the food remove the rope get a sit or a touch or some kind of weight and then okay repeat at some point you're going to come halfway around dog's going to drop expecting the food there's your drop it when they drop it, pay them that piece of food. But on the next one, when you say drop it and they drop it, say, okay, take it and use tug as your reinforcer. If you're playing fetch and tug and you have work to eat toys, you're going to be literally 
taking care of about 90% of the mouthing and the biting. The other 10% reduction or 9% because there's no 100% comes in well-placed timeouts. So if you're playing with the puppy, right, however you're playing with them, and we'll talk about that in a second, but you're playing with the puppy and they're like, they're biting your, okay, okay, oh, it's too bad, too bad. And you just take the puppy and you put them in a little pen, right? Or you put them down in a gated area, right? You pop them in their crate for 10 seconds, 10 second timeout, 10, that's it. You let them back out. If they go for your pant leg, you say, leave it. Okay, good boy. Pop, pop, pop. Squeaky, squeak, throw a toy. Get them moving. One of the things I often tell people is your living room or your basement, like wherever you play with your puppy, where this is a puppy's going to hang out and play, the floor should look like a toy store blew up. You should have nine squeaky toys, seven Kongs, like literally two bully sticks. Because if there's all this stuff on the ground, you have a redirection. The dog might be might not even care about the table leg or you if there's all this going on. And you always have a way to keep the dog engaged, right? When I go to someone's house for a private session and I walk in and they're like, yeah, this is where the puppy plays and there's one toy. I'm like, all right, hold on a second. I just take my backpack out and I just give them like four Kongs and three, to three other toys. And we don't hear from the puppy for two hours. Right. They're, right. So if you're doing well-placed timeouts, you're giving the dog something to do legally every day and you're playing fetch and tug, mouthing goes away really fast. The problem people run into is cut it out, out, cut it out, how, stop, 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 no bite, no bite. Just walk away. You know what I mean? That's level one. Walk away. That's a timeout. You don't get me if you're biting all over me. L level two is I'm going to scoop you up and time you out, put you in jail for 10 seconds. If you do this, same thing with jumping, right? We'll talk about that in a sec. You get a dog who learns the sequence because remember, dogs figure everything out based on sequential predictions, right? Op operant conditioning, right? So if the sequence is, hey, when I mouth this human, I don't get their attention or I get put into doggy jail, that puppy's going to learn real quick. The reason why they keep mouthing up to like, you know, 18, 20 weeks is that people are going, hey, cut it out, out, cut it out. They have one toy, they never play fetch and talk, right? So that's how you handle the mouthing. The jumping is easy, it really is. Now, we're going to remove toy breeds and minis <laughs> from this because I give them a big reprieve. If you have a at full age weight, seven pound Maltese, I'm not going to worry that your dog jumps up on you. I'm not even going to just walk away. Just say, it's okay. Make sure you don't step on the poor dog, right? Just ignore them, right? But let's say all the other puppies, medium to large dogs, right? Walk away level one. Level two is too bad to time the dog out. Snatch them up. Gently time them out, but you all start also start teaching an auto sit and a touch. So the puppy's approaching you, wait, sit, right? You give them the hand signal, right, for wait, and then you give them the hand signal for sit. When they sit, you give them a treat. You toss a toy, or you let them jump on you. You invite them up because I always tell people it's not jumping on people that's bad. It's them. It's dogs doing it without the invitation. So you teach your dog a wait and a sit which you need to anyway, because life is pretty much leave it, wait, sit, <laughs> leave it, wait, sit, right? Life with dogs is pretty much like, don't do that, do this. That's a leave it. And I need you to wait a sec, right? Whether you stand or sit. So if you're getting the puppy to learn that when I approach people, I wait and sit or they walk away or they time me out. And then the other is hand targeting, right? So you get, you get a touch, hand signal for touch. The camera's kind of weird, but so you get a dog to target your palm. And then they have two options when they approach people. And I always tell my clients, your friends and family, your guests will be much better served with the touch. It's easier for people to just put their hand out as a target than to try to do a sit, 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 and they're leaning over, right? So if you have consistency with friends and family, you're managing the puppy so they don't rehearse it. So you got friends and family over. I always tell people, most people want 30 seconds to a minute and they're done with your dog, especially if they're not really there to see the dog. So you can either micromanage it all, manage the puppy behind the gate with work to eat toys, or you can play, you know, time out, too bad, you know, you, you can't jump on Aunt Billy, you know, uh, ta, 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 ta. You, you, can't, you can't do anything. So you got to play referee. You can't just, oh, he's a puppy, he's jumping all over you. Oh my God, he's so cute. Because that's just teaching the puppy, you know, look, there's no rules here. You can just run ramshod. And where you want to teach a puppy that you can rip and run, there's less rules, is outside, right? And even there, there's going to be rules. Like you have to have structure. One of the biggest mistakes that people think and other trainers think about positive trainers is that we don't have any consequences. We don't set things up. We don't use punishment. I punish without pain. I punish without fear, right? If I tell you, I'm going to give you $100, and I don't, I punished you. I didn't make you afraid. I didn't hurt you. I disappointed you, right? right? I'll disappoint a puppy all day long. Too bad. You're not doing that. Here you go. Boom. You're in the crate. 10 seconds. Yep. Figure it out. You can't jump on a counter. 
Like, I don't get stressed. That's the thing I tell people, don't get upset. Dogs have the cognition of three-year-old kids by the time they're two, right? So your puppy, I, when people come to me and they're like, the puppy, oh my God. I said, hold on, oh, hold, hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. First of all, first of all, I don't live with you, right? So don't, right? I didn't tell you to get a puppy. So I, you want my help. First thing you got to have is reasonable expectations. How old is your puppy? He's 12 weeks. Tw say that again, 12 weeks. I tell all my clients with puppies, you have dogs with the word weeks after their age. It's a baby. Yeah, and it's a baby for life, right? So, but right now in puppyhood, it's really crucial that you have patience and you have understanding and you have empathy and you chill the F out. <laughs> like yeah. seriously, because if you're wiling out on a puppy or if you're yelling and you're like, you're not doing anybody any favors and you have to ask yourself, and I've asked people this, you know, not all the time, but occasionally, why did you get a puppy? Maybe you would have been better served the two-year-old dog who's laying in a shelter right now who's sad and he's just going to lay on your couch when you're at work he's going to eat three bowls of food and walk with you and play with some dog friends right so again it goes back to when somebody says i want to get a puppy it's work right the two-year-old dog from the shelter might be work might be different kind of work dogs are work no matter what but puppies are work hands down you're working for a year maybe two right depending on the dog the breed like you know your lifestyle um i, I meet plenty of dogs who are a year and five months and those people have to work. They're, they're not just, they're just not working. And that's why it's going poorly for everybody. Well, and it's, it's the, the families with very small children that are bringing a brand new puppy in yep. and the stress that it causes not and, realizing that the puppy yeah. does as much work as these little kids are, maybe even more. Maybe more. And while I totally understand why, why people, let's say we'll draw up a scenario of the, seven and 10 year old, right? The family has a seven and a 10 year old. They want a dog for the kids before the kids are in high school. They want some time and I get all that and they, they should have it, but just know your kids aren't gonna do anything for the puppy. Even, even the exception, like the 10 year old kid who can like help with the dishes and he's just, right? Great, he's still gotta go to school, right? Okay. He's not gonna walk the dog at 11 o'clock at night. He's gonna be in bed and he's not gonna get up at 2 a.m. when the dog's crying. He's not gonna clean the diarrhea out of the crate. He's probably, right? So the bulk of the work is falling on the adult. So I tell people, don't get a dog for your kids. Get a dog for you, you. because you want a dog. Now, the other side of this is we have a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year old dog and we want a puppy because we know this whether they want a puppy for the other dog to play with or the dog's older and they want to get a puppy. So when the other dog, but you have to understand when you get a puppy, not only is it work, but when you have two dogs, you don't know if that other dog is going to have any interest in dealing with this puppy. Because if it's been living in a house by itself for right. four or five, whatever, how many years now you bring this puppy in a one hour around the breeder, neighborhood greeting is not an indication of how well the puppy and the dog are going to do once the puppy goes over and disturbs the dog or gets in its food, all these things, right? So if you're going to get a puppy and you have another dog, you have to understand management is supervision to protect the older dog or the, or even if the older dog loves the puppy, but they can only play with this dog for seven minutes because by minute eight, he's like, get away. I'm tired of you. Go, go. What are you, leave me alone. What are you doing? Right. That means on minute six, you need to say, OK, my puppy and put the puppy behind the gate to help the older dog not become frustrated because you don't want the older dog snapping up on the puppy. That's work. That's attention to detail. That's understanding, having that information. Right. Like, oh, let the dog just teach the puppy. Well, it's OK if he snaps. up. No, it's really not OK if he snaps up on him, because number one, the puppy could get hurt. Number two, the puppy's going to get bigger. So right now, we let's say we got a five-year-old dog who's 50 pounds, right? And we got a puppy who's eight weeks and he's five pounds. Right. right. But that puppy's going to grow up. One day, that big dog in the house is going to look over and go, oh, so you got bigger in a couple of weeks. Wow. And I'm afraid of you. I didn't like you when you were five pounds. So you want the puppy and the older dog to actually like each other and tolerate and not be afraid of each other. That takes work. That takes proactive counter conditioning. That takes protecting resources with diligent management so there's no resource guarding issues. That means you don't walk the puppy in one hand and your other dog in the other. That's dangerous. That means you're doing two separate walks or your husband, wife, or if you have somebody else in the house or in your life that can help you walk the other dog, 
you have them walked at the same time with their own handler, you counter condition, you let dogs smell each other's rears and stuff like that. That's work. That's work. You have to let the puppy out first to go to the bathroom. Your other dog might be like, ah, rah, rah, I always go out first. Yeah, but you can hold it, kid, because you're seven. This dog is 10 weeks, and I got to get him out first. Sorry, kid. That's stress at five in the morning when you have your five-year-old dog. It's stress for the dog. It's stress. Now, I'm not saying that will be every case, but those are the kind of little things that you know, can start to chip away at your patients. Those are the kind of things that can get somebody in the house going, you know, what's wrong here? And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. That's all normal. Everything I just talked about is all potentials for two dogs, one young, one older, etc. All these are the potentials for if you've got kids and you have a puppy, where's the time going to fall, right? Who's going to help this puppy? Because if your kids, what I would tell anybody watching this, here's a great time to get a puppy for your kids when they're in high school. You know why? You know why? And wait till they're driving. Number one, when you're driving, your brain has developed risk assessment. So that'll help you when you walk the puppy, when parents say, look, I need you to help out. Right. Number two, you got a car so you can help your parents to a certain degree if you're a responsible kid. Number three, your kids are in school. They're in high school. Maybe they're going to college. They're studying. They're busy. They're not nine. Yeah, mom, I'm done with homework. I put the blocks together. I know how to add four and seven. Now I'm, you know, I'm a kid. I, I need, oh, puppy, pup, right? So when your kids are teenagers, they're busy. So they're going to help you. They're going to be able to engage the puppy. And they're also going to be able to understand when you hire a legitimate dog trainer, they're going to be able to understand all that stuff and help you out and, and remind you, hey, don't yell at the puppy. Remember what the trainer said. So again, I'm not saying people shouldn't get a puppy when their kids are young. Just be prepared for the work because your, your kids aren't helping you. Right. So what do you suggest that a person have as far as tools and equipment before that puppy ever shows up? Good, good question. You definitely need a crate. You need some kind of gating system in your house or a pen. Um, you also need to make sure your puppy is on a harness properly fitted, which is challenging because puppies grow and sometimes they're not big enough yet. So you need to make sure your puppy's on a harness. Their developing neck doesn't need to be choked. They will pull. There will be resistant. That trachea and that windpipe are delicate. Acopedial nerves go down the side of the neck for the dog's eyes. So you definitely want to get your puppy on a harness. You need a bevy of work to eat toys. You're not, you're not going to do well with one. I can tell people when they go, oh, yeah, we have that Kong. I go, good, get 10 more, right? Because those frozen Kongs that you make every Sunday that you stick in the freezer in a Ziploc bag, you tell your seven-year-old kid, do me a favor, go grab one of those baby Kongs for the puppy because he's, you know, we walked him for a half hour, but he's still a little energetic and we need to do your homework and take a bath and blah, 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 blah. We're humans, right? So boom, there's your frozen Kong. Now the puppy's quiet. So you need a bevy of work to eat toys, squeaky toys, all that. And to be honest, what you also need is you need a professional in your life so you can get guidance. You need a, a, somebody who really knows puppies. Don't just hire a trainer. Yeah, we can work with puppies. No, hire somebody whose resume is, no, we work with puppies. I work with 400 dogs a year, and I would say 300 of those are puppies. I work with an average of 50 puppies a week. And keep So I know puppies. Yeah, I know there puppies. There is an expense to <laughs> yep. that. Right. And you need to allow for. Right. And we would think that everybody watching this would know that, but you're you're absolutely right. We should reiterate that dogs cost money. And and you you what I always tell people is it's better to throw a dollar fifty on the floor and watch it go away than seven. So that's why you go to the big pet retailers online and you buy a box of squeaky toys that cost you forty dollars, but each toy in the box is a buck. Because when you buy them down at the boutique, and even though we want to support our local places, Right. So you got to be you got to be crafty about it. Right. And if you buy in bulk, a lot of places will give you a discount. So if my puppy is like this on a bully stick at eight weeks, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And the dog is addicted to bully sticks. I buy a case. Yeah, because it's going to rain. I don't want to run out. Oh, the game is on. Oh, that's right. He's coming over. We got to do the thing. Bully stick. Right. Frozen calm. Right. And people think, oh, you're just feeding away problems. No, what I'm doing is what people do in zoos and sanctuaries for animals that need mental stimulation. People have to realize nobody's got six hours a day for a dog. If you do, you're retired. And even then, you're not doing six hours. You maybe give your dog a good hour in the morning, right? And then you're home. I mean, this idea that's been propagated that you're going to like, you're not. You're not. You're not. You're going to give your dog a half hour at a time. And then you're going to go be a, a, a something else other than a dog parent. You're going to give your dog 15 minutes at a time. Then you're going to do something else. You give your dog two hours at a time, right? That's how it works with dogs. I, I do this enough. I've yet to meet somebody who's like, yeah, man, I get up at 6 a.m. and I have all day till 6 p.m. to work with my dog. Never, not once. 
Nobody. And I work with millionaires and I work with people who are, who are reg, you know, trying to save money enough to hire me. Everybody has a work schedule. Everybody has a life schedule. So you have to work the dog into that. And that's why you really need to be prepared. Um, I don't even think the finance part is really that much of a concern. I mean, if you don't have enough money to get a dog, then there's a problem. Um, but it's really time and energy, like giving that dog what it needs in that developmental stage and then for the rest of its life. You know, I meet a lot of people who did everything relatively well for a couple of years. They came to my puppy class and they call me two and a half years in. And I just, I had a woman just do this to me. And I was like, you're just not doing it. You have all the answers. You have all the answers. Right. So you got to do the work. And on that note, we will say puppies, we love them. They're wonderful, but they are work and they will be a wonderful enhancement to your life as long as you realize the work that's coming and accept it and just know they will grow out of it. And uh, they may or may not. Right. Like, that's the thing. Like, you know, I don't lead people astray. I don't say anything's going to happen about growing out. What I say is you set the foundation in. And you do the work daily, and then you have less stress. Less stress. Absolutely. And Nothing's perfect. Without fear and without pain. Hey, Drew, oh, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. We'll see Take you care. Bye-bye. If you'd like to participate in the rest of today's conversation for professionals who work with dogs and receive continuing education credits from participating organizations for listening, visit gooddogpro.com and subscribe today. Use coupon DOGSROCK to get 40% off your first month or annual subscription.